All right, if you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to open them up to Ephesians chapter 4. We're continuing our series, Real Family, and we've been walking through a number of different passages of Scripture that, that talk about the church, specifically about how Christians are called to relate to one another and how we're called to relate to God. And as we've talked through that, we, we've noticed that everything God's talking about with relation to the church would make a huge difference in our physical families as well if we began to apply them. And so as I'm I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself. Uh, I, I remember that my first and closest neighbor is my wife, right? So I need to love her the very same way. So I pray that as we've been walking through this series, you've not only been growing in your understanding of the church, but also growing in your understanding of how your family can grow stronger and bring glory to God the Father through obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. While you turn there, I want to tell you a little bit about my childhood. So I was on a, a lot of different teams when I was a young kid. Um, I was on academic teams, you know, we would go to this thing they called the Brain Bowl, and so, you know, there were times when we were, uh, you know, competing in social studies competitions and math competitions and science competitions, and I loved the competitiveness of it and having a team, and we would all help each other memorize facts, and of course, I played a lot of sports growing up, haven't always been shaped like a basketball, I actually used to play basketball, and um, so I, I, but I played football, and I played baseball, and I ran track, and I swam, and I ran cross country. Whatever sport was in season, I did it, and I, I, I got, I loved being a part of a team. I was even on a break dancing crew in the seventh grade, and that was fun. Now, it was at Clay High, so it wasn't real impressive, but nevertheless, I was with a group of guys, and we hung out, and we had a, a common goal and a common purpose. And, but the, of all the teams I was a part of, the one I was the most connected to was my high school basketball team. Ed White Commanders, 1988 to 1990, 12 guys, one goal, one family, one agenda, lots of hard work. And as we did that hard work together, we grew as close as brothers. And there are days I miss those guys. It wasn't too long ago, I walked into a restaurant and I sat down, I was, I was drinking a Coke, I was waiting for my, my order, and I looked across the restaurant and I saw this guy that looked kind of familiar. And I didn't know where I knew him from, and then I thought, you know, that looks an awful lot like a guy I used to play basketball with. I mean, he's older and fatter, but that could be him. <laughs> and at the same time, he's thinking the very same thing about me. That looks an awful lot like an older, fatter version of Chris Bontz. And so finally I got up and walked over and I was like, is your name Vince? He was like, Chris? I was like, we shook hands, we started talking. I was like, man, it's so good to connect with you because we left Jacksonville not too long after I graduated, so I didn't stay in touch with a lot of these guys. And it was just great to connect with him. And as we're talking, he said, you know, I, I really miss the camaraderie and the teamwork and the sense of purpose that we all had. And... I said, yeah, I miss that too, but I'll be honest with you, I get to experience all of that in the body of my local church. I'm closer to my brothers and sisters in Christ than I ever was to a basketball team. That camaraderie, that sense of teamwork and purpose, I have it all right here. So what I want to ask you this morning is, have you ever experienced that sense of connection? that sense of belonging, that sense of true community that comes to those who are a vital part, a contributing part of a team. Because if you haven't, the Bible says you can. You just have to step into fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. So today, I'm going to challenge you to become a part of the team. And for some of you, that's going to mean you're, you're finally going to believe the gospel and you're going to turn from your sin and trust Christ as your Lord and Savior. For others, that's going to mean you're going to take a step of faith and unite with the church and say, I want to be a part of this family. I, don't want, to, I, want, to, I want to get to know other people and I want them to get to know me and I want to begin to work with them. And for others, that's going to mean finding your life purpose. Stepping forward into service and figuring out that one or those two gifts that God has given you with the intention of blessing others. But I'm going to challenge all of you to step into team. Why? Because real family is where I'm part of a team. As we come to Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is writing to a church that is struggling to develop unity 
and community because of their diversity. They're so radically different from one another because of their backgrounds that there's not a lot of unity. And because there's not a lot of unity, they weren't a team. So when the church starts, it's a bunch of Jewish people, and they, they grew up a certain way. And they dressed a certain way, they sang a certain way, they ate a certain way. And so they had this kind of uncommon bond that was tied to a common heritage. Well, in obedience to Jesus Christ, they've gone out and they've just been preaching the gospel to people in their community, and lo and behold, Gentiles start coming to faith in Christ. And these Gentiles, they didn't grow up the same way the Jews did. They, they, they sang different songs, they, they worshiped differently, they ate different kinds of foods, and so you put them all in the same family and it just kind of creates tension. I mean, can you imagine the potlucks? Jews have been keeping kosher laws their whole life. They've never been exposed to a lot of foods, therefore they don't really like those kind of foods. As a matter of fact, they're probably repulsed by certain kinds of foods. And in the ancient world, the average Gentile would eat anything that moved. Right, and so they, they would come together and one group would be offended by the other group and then the other group would say, get over it. I don't know much about the Bible, but I've learned that those food laws don't apply anymore. Have some ham, right? And so they would just go back and forth and, and it would create all kinds of tension and diversity. And it, it wasn't just food, it was everything. Everything. And so the Apostle Paul is writing them as they're struggling to live as one, and he gives them some admonitions that help, that help them develop unity. And as a church, as we read this text today, if we will obey the text, it will help us be the church that God wants us to be. So begin reading with me. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, I, therefore a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a coast of half captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may be no longer children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So we're talking about real family, real families that are a team. First thing we see in this text is that real families are marked by sacrificial relationships. You look at verses one through three, you see these words, humble, gentle, patient. Paul says you need to bear with one another. Those are sacrificial behaviors. Those are selfless behaviors behaviors. Those are the kind of behaviors that cause me to take a back seat to someone else's hurts, to someone else's needs, to someone else's desires. We read this text and we see that the body is called to speak the truth in love to one another. That means we're willing to have difficult conversations. And as we do that, we build ourselves up in love. So these, these behaviors are very others-focused Others focused in the sense that I want others to have the best. I want others to do the best. I want others to grow in Christ's likeness. Not I want others to have less so I can have more. 
not I want others to fold so I can get my way. And as we continue to read these texts, I want you to see the Christian life is one that has never lived in isolation. It's lived in community as we share our lives with one another. And so I want, I want to zero in on these four descriptors that the Apostle Paul gives us, that the Holy Spirit gives us. The Bible calls us to be humble, to be men and women who are marked by humility. So as we think about interpersonal relationships, humility means that I don't always assume I'm right and you're wrong. That's how most disagreements happen. That's how most fights happen. That's why most people can't get back together after they have a big falling out, right? I'm right, you're wrong. The only way we're going to get together is if you admit that I'm right and you're wrong and you come to me. Humility means that we walk into relationships, we walk into conversations, not assuming we have all the answers, not assuming we have the perfect perspective, not assuming we're always right. Now listen, I can think I'm right when we have a disagreement, but I'm willing to lay my understanding on the table and allow you to critique it and have a conversation with one another. And I'm willing to do that because I love you and I care about you. And those kinds of conversations, those kinds of relationships should mark our marriages, mark our families, and mark our church. So he calls us to humility. He calls us to gentleness. Gentleness means that when something happens, I don't work to escalate the situation even if I'm right. Gentle means I'm not walking around looking for something to be offended by. If only we could apply that to our social media, right? Gentleness means that when I have a disagreement with you, we're going to sit down and work it out. I'm going to do it in a way that's as painless as possible for you as we work to find common ground that's grounded in Scripture. Then he says, patient. Why patient? Because none of us have arrived. None of us is where God's, we're going to be when God's done with us. And so in my relationships, I have to be patient with you even as you're patient with me. I'm waiting for God to do a work in both of our lives so we can find common ground and work together. And, and most of the time, we're going to work together. But as we work together, there are going to be times when I make you mad and you make me mad and, well, in those situations, we're going to be patient with one another, right? We're not going to take our ball and go home. We're not going to throw our stuff down and walk away, never to be seen again. We're going to be patient with one another, mindful that God's doing a work in our lives. And more mature Christians are going to be patient with less mature Christians. So if we get aggressive and really start sharing the gospel in our community, my hope is we see a lot of broken people come to church. A lot of broken people give their lives to the Lord. And when they come to church and they give their lives to the Lord, they're not going to have it all figured out. How do we know that? Because a lot of us have been walking with the Lord for a long time and none of us have it all figured out. Right? We're all jacked up. And we've got to be patient with one another. You know, some, some people are fearful we're going to have a bunch of unchurched kids and teenagers running around campus breaking everything. I hope that happens. Over and over and over again. Now, we'll try to rein them in and break fewer things, but I'd rather have a bunch of things getting broken because lost people are on campus hearing the gospel in our kids' ministry and our student ministry than have everything pristine and nothing ever going wrong and nobody coming to faith in Christ. And so we've got to be patient with one another as we figure out how we're going to do the best job to minister to our community. That means I've got to be willing to listen. I've got to be willing to wait on God to do a work in your life, even as God is doing a work in my life. Remember when you called me as your pastor, I said I'm going to do, I promise you three things. I promise to love you, I promise to tell you the truth, and I promise I'm going to let you down at some point in the future. Not because I want to, but just because I'm a fallible human being. I'm going to forget to call somebody. I'm going to forget to make a visit. I'm going to make a change that you don't particularly like. And when that happens, I need you to be patient with me. And I'll do the same for you. And together we'll keep chasing after Christ and chasing after the lost people in our community with the gospel. And then my favorite part of these first few verses, the Apostle Paul says, bearing with one another in love. 
I actually don't think that's the best translation for the 21st century. If we were going to transver, translate this into Middleburg English, it would say putting up with one another. Because that's exactly what Paul's calling us to do, right? You just got to learn to put up with one another. Because we're all different, and we have different expectations, and we, we don't always use the same words the same way, and we're not always sharing a common wavelength with regard to how we're thinking or what we're doing. And in those uh, uh, instances where we're not all on the same page, we're just going to put up with one another. Kind of the way I put up with Tom Smith. I, I, mean, I love the brother, but you know, sometimes I just got to put up with him. And, and he says the same thing about me all the time. So... Real families are marked by sacrificial relationships. The person sitting next to you is more important than you are from your perspective. So the question shouldn't be, are we singing enough songs to make me happy? Or are, are, are we designing our worship services in a way that blesses me? Are we meeting in a time that's convenient for me? Are we launching ministries and programs that are designed to meet all my needs? Behaviors that are others focused. Sacrificial relationships lead to spiritual unity. Notice how Paul continues. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. In the ancient world, they didn't use bold font, so the way they emphasized something was through repetition. If you look at these uh, verses here, you see that in three short verses, the word one is repeated seven times times. Paul wants us to see unity, not because of who we are, not because of our backgrounds, not because of our giftedness, not because of our love of a particular style of music or our love for a particular political party or our love for where we live, but because of God. One God who is over all, through all, and in all. Paul's point was that despite their differences, and by the way, their differences were real and they were significant. There were different ethnicities in this church, different religious backgrounds in this church, different kinds of jobs in this church, different kinds of families in this church. Despite all of their differences, which were real and significant, Paul says, what unites you is bigger than what divides you, so learn to focus on that. And what is it that unites them? It is their faith. It's the indwelling Holy Spirit. It's the way they were saved. That's what Paul's saying when he says live lives that are worthy of the calling to which you were called. He's talking about the calling of the gospel, the calling to salvation. So think about this. How were, how were you saved? How was I saved? Exactly the same way. The Bible teaches that we're all sinners. We've fallen short of God's standard. And because we're all sinners, there's not a single one of us that could ever earn a right relationship with God. There's not a single one of us that could ever merit a right relationship with God. But God in his great love did not want us to be separated from him. And so the, at the appropriate time in history, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, who descended from heaven into the lower regions of the earth, which is what it says here in Ephesians. And he lived a sinless life. He did for you and me what we could not do for ourselves. The Bible says the penalty for uh, sin is death and eternal separation from God. That's what you deserve. That's what I deserve. Jesus Christ was the one person in the history of the world that did not deserve to die. But at the appropriate time, die he did. He was arrested, illegally tried, and nailed to a Roman cross. An instrument of torture and death. And the Bible teaches that when Jesus died that physical death, the Father placed on him the sins of the world. He bore my sin and your sin. And three days later, the Bible teaches that to show that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ had been accepted, 
to show that Jesus was innocent of all the charges leveled against him, to show that God had the power over life and death, he raised his son from the grave. And the Bible teaches that if any person repents of their sin and believes that Jesus died for them and rose from the grave and calls out to God and asks to be saved, that God will save them. And that is how every single person is saved. Who is saved? White people saved the same way as black people. Africans saved the same way as Europeans. Rich saved the same way as the poor. Educated saved the same way as the uneducated. Emotionally stable saved the same way as the emotionally challenged. The healthy saved the same way as the sick. It doesn't matter. Jew, Gentile, everybody is saved the same way. God did not save you because he needed you. God did not save you because you were some great person and you were going to be this great asset to the kingdom. God saved you. God saved me in spite of who we were, not because of who we were. And that unites us. We're all saved the very same way. And that's why he doesn't say that we need to pursue unity. He doesn't, we don't need to build unity. We need to maintain unity. Why? Because he's already done everything we need for unity. We just have to focus on the gospel and the fact that without the gospel, we have nothing. So, real families are marked by spiritual, sacrificial relationships. Sacrificial relationships don't care about themselves. They focus on who God is and what God's done. That leads to spiritual unity. So we continue walking through this text. We see that spiritually unified churches follow gifted leaders. Now, I'm not saying, look at me, I'm a gifted leader. I'm saying God gifts his church with leaders. So you continue reading in verse 7. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended to heaven, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? Talking about his humanity, talking about his incarnation. Verse 10, he who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. So God saves this group of individuals and makes them a family, makes them a team, makes them a single people. And then he gifts the church with leaders, leaders who are spiritually gifted to lead the church. And as the church follows its leadership, significant things begin to happen. So here's what you need to see. In this text, he gave the apostles, those are the ones who were selected by Jesus who would produce the New Testament. He gave the prophets, those who would actually speak the word of God in the church before the Bible was given. He gave the evangelists, those who proclaimed the gospel and equipped others to do the same thing. He gave the shepherds, that word is the word pastor, is literally the only occurrence of the word pastor in the entire New Testament. And teachers, why did he give them? To equip the saints for the work of ministry. So God gave leadership to facilitate unity and team and true community. And how does, uh, how does this leadership facilitate unity? How does this leadership facilitate uh, teamwork and community? They do it through discipleship. Notice the job of the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. It's to equip the saints for the work of ministry. It's not to do the work of ministry. Now, I'm a leader and a saint in regards to this text, right? So my job is not to do the work of ministry. My job is to equip you to do the work of ministry, then to roll my sleeves up and get in the trenches with you, and together we make a huge difference. But that's why God gives leaders, to equip all of us to do the work of ministry. The expectation is all of us are going to do the work of ministry. 
And that's what leads to our final point. And yes, I know what time it is. Bear with me, right? So when unified churches follow gifted leaders, several things begin to happen. Number one, they produce maximum impact. The saints are equipped for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood or adulthood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may be no longer children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So as the saints do the work of ministry... It actually strengthens the church. It allows and empowers the church to have greater impact, to have maximum impact. So let me ask you a question. We have seven full-time pastors at our church and a host of other staff members and directors and that type of thing. Think about the impact that a team of 15 could have on our community. Now, how much impact can 1,000 people have on our community? A thousand people working together, moving in the same direction, listening to the word of God as it's proclaimed and modeled and taught by its leadership. That's that's what we want to be. Not because we want to be the biggest church in our community, but because we are surrounded by people who are far from God like we once were, and we want them to know the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we all find our gifts and we encourage one another as we chase after Christ for the sake of the lost in our community and the glory of God who saved us. When unified churches follow gifted leaders, they produce maximum impact. When unified churches follow gifted leaders, they are intentionally inclusive. Notice, Paul's assuming everybody's a part of this. You see the words all, the whole body, every joint. There's a place for you in what we're doing. There's a difference that you can make as you step forward into the ministry of this church, as you step forward into the life of this church. There's a place for everyone. You think, man, I see Pastor Chris up there preaching. I could never do that. Number one, if God calls you to do it, he would equip you to do it, and you absolutely could do that. But number two, it may not be what God's calling you to do. There there are ministries in this church that I can't do. We need everyone. I said this last week, you're going to hear me say this over and over and over again in the years to come. You do not have all of the spiritual gifts. We all have at least one, but none of us has all of them. You do not have all of the spiritual gifts, but you need all of the spiritual gifts. Where do you find them? In the life of the body, in the church, as you participate in the family. When unified churches follow gifted leaders, they're intentionally inclusive. They're inviting everyone that claims the name of Jesus to join with them, and they're helping every single person find their place of ministry. And then finally, when unified churches follow gifted leaders, they grow spiritually mature. Listen to me. Spiritual mature churches, they're not tossed to and fro by human cunning and deceitful schemes. You know, a lot of times we read that and we think about all the false teachers. And we, and we, we think about all the different theological issues they had to deal with in the first century. I, I think just as... Uh, big a threat would be the schemes of the enemy just to make us fight with one another and give up on one another and bail on one another. And the Bible teaches that as we all come together and work together and love one another and sacrifice for one another and buy into what God is doing at our church, that it makes us spiritually strong. And that's good news because there are days in my life when I'm weak. But I can rely on your strength. And there are days when you're weak, but you can rely on my strength. And a thousand people working together will always be stronger than a single individual. And so let me, let me say this as we prepare to close. We talk a lot about spiritual maturity, 
I believe with all my heart the New Testament teaches and models that spiritual maturity will never happen apart from active participation in the life of a church. Knowledge will happen. You can learn a lot about the Bible on your own, but you will never be a spiritually mature Christian if you're not actively participating in the life of the church. Why? Because there are too many commands you cannot obey if you're living as a lone ranger. There, there, there's too much pressure in the world to be the person that God wants you to be if you're separated and isolated. And so today, I want to challenge you to step into the life of the church. I began our sermon this morning. I said, listen, here's, here's what we're going to do today. I'm going to challenge you to become a part of the team. And, and the way you're going to become a part of the team today will be a different for every single person in this room. We can boil it down to three general areas, though. For some of you, that means you're finally going to have to surrender to the gospel, surrender to the call of Jesus Christ on your life. Maybe you've been hearing this, this stuff about Jesus forever. You know he's God, God's son. You know he died on the cross. You know he rose from the grave. But you've never allowed the good news of the gospel to penetrate your heart and change your life. Today I'm going to ask you to do that. Just a moment, we're going to stand and sing a song of response. I'm going to be standing right down here. Now there's never been a time in your life when you trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior. When you took that first step of faith, I'm just asking you to slip out and just come tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, Pastor Chris, we need to talk. You might be here this morning thinking, what's everybody going to think if I go talk to Chris? They're going to think it's the greatest thing in the world and they're going to celebrate that you're doing that. There's not a single person in this room that's going to judge you or think negatively about you because you're making a decision to follow Christ. They're going to celebrate that, and they're going to walk with you. Maybe you're here this morning, though. You've trusted in Christ, but you've never taken the next step to connect with his family. You know, the Bible teaches that God saves us as individuals, but he doesn't leave us individuals. He adopts us into his family. And so today, maybe you need to take a step of faith and declare your intention to be baptized. Or maybe you need to declare your intention to unite with our church. I want to challenge you to do that. I'll be down front. Staff will be down front. There will be opportunities for you to learn more about membership in the days and weeks to come. But maybe this morning God's calling you to take a step of faith and to unite with the church. And listen, I know there's probably some folks here today that are just, you've gotten burned in the past. Like, I've been there, done that. I, I'm not going to do church again. Folks, that's God's plan A. He doesn't have a plan B. Take a step of faith. Share your life with brothers and sisters in Christ who want to share theirs with you, who want to love you and pray for you and encourage you and help you be all that God's calling you to be. Maybe you're here this morning and you're, you're a Christian. You've trusted Christ. You've been baptized. Your name's even been on our church roster for years or decades but you've never found your life purpose. You've never just made the effort to figure out what your gift is, how God wants to use you to strengthen your brothers and sisters in Christ. Listen, guys, I want to give you more. I want to do more than to give you a job. I want to help you discover your life purpose. Why did God make you? And you'll never discover that sitting and soaking. You've got to step into the fellowship. You've got to step into ministry. And if you'll do that and continue to do that, continue to walk in that direction, God will make it abundantly clear in his timing. Whatever your need is this morning, know this. God has met that need in Christ. All he's asking you to do today is to say yes to him. So as we prepare to stand together and sing this morning, I'm going to invite you to say yes to the Lord.